how do professionals leverage their public policy training into successful careers? How are they impacting current policy? Welcome to the School of Public Policy's new profile series. Today, we invite you to join the conversation as we speak with Penn State alumnus, Joe Marie, about his work in transportation infrastructure and policy. Hi, I'm Whitney Sheridan, Director of Communications for the School of Public Policy at Penn State along with Katherine Baumgartner, our Director of Professional Development and Student Engagement. Our guest today is Joe Marie, Senior Vice President and Managing Director of WSP's Rail Transit Systems Group. WSP provides technical expertise and strategic advice to clients in the transportation and infrastructure, property and buildings, environment, industry, resources, and energy sectors as well as offering project and program delivery and advisory, advisory services. He's also overseeing the East Side Access Project. It's the largest transportation infrastructure project currently being undertaken in North America. And we're gonna ask him about that in a little bit. Joe, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's uh, good to be here. So I want to let everyone know, this is an, an opportunity for you to ask Joe questions and engage with him, ask him about his experiences. We want this to be your conversation. So we encourage you through to out today's discussion to use that Q&A box or the chat at any time and ask your questions throughout the conversation. So first, I guess I wanna start off, Joe, by talking a little bit about your background. Um, after earning your master's in public administration from Penn State, what drew your focus to transportation policy and infrastructure? Well, uh, to be honest with you, I had a little bit of um, uh, experience uh, before I went to the graduate school at Penn State uh, for public administration. It was the Institute of Public Administration at the time in 1985. And before that, I had served in Congress for um, uh, a congressman from Massachusetts and uh, worked on the senatorial campaign for John Kerry, uh, who became Secretary of State and also is now uh, uh, one of the top uh, Homeland Security and climate control uh, types of folks working for President Biden. So I got into the transportation uh, policy side of things because the congressman that I was working for worked on the transportation uh, committee in the House. And um, so I, I was, I had some interest in it. I didn't really know how much of an interest, uh, but I went to Europe uh, after I graduated from Penn State and I got uh, into taking a lot of public transportation. So I, uh, when I came back, I decided to make a career of it. I actually started uh, working for the MBTA in Boston, which is the public transit authority in there. What was called at the time, uh, the Office of Transportation Access. It was, it was pre-ADA, it was before the Americans with Disabilities Act was even um, uh, uh, formed or written, but the MBTA was uh, really progressive and really trying to make their transportation system accessible to people who have mobility devices. So I was brought in to write the, uh, the organization's um, uh, uh, access plan for the subway system. So that's really how I kind of got into uh, public transport, as it were. So uh, that's how it all began. So why a passion for transportation specifically? I mean, you work a lot with trains. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But why specifically transportation? Well, you know, I, I think some of it goes back to, you know, I testified before the, the Senate Banking and Infrastructure Committee uh, back in 2009. Um, they were trying to take up legislation, the omnibus transportation bill, which, by the way, they haven't done in about uh, 14 years. Uh, but uh, so my testimony wasn't overly effective uh, in getting them to pass any legislation. <laughs> but uh, but uh, nonetheless, I had that experience. But when I, you know, when I spoke before the Senate, I, I you know, I come from Boston, you know, and I grew up, um, you know, really reliant uh, in many respects on public transportation. I took public transportation to get to school. Uh, so, you know, um, that was kind of uh, inbred in, in, in part of my life. And, you know, for me, getting on, you know, the train and, 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 and the subway was the way of, uh, of, of really exercising your freedom and uh, to move and to grow and to learn and to, and to see different parts of, of the city. And in the end, it became, uh, you know, I believe that 
the way we are connected now. Uh, you know, when I was when I was, you know, we didn't have things like the internet uh, in, in 1986. Uh, there may have been, but you know, the infrastructure was there for it, but it was certainly not open to everybody at the time. You know, people connected by physically traveling to visit each other, right? So, um, you know, it was a way for me to sort of uh, explore the world. And um, like I said, when I went to Europe, I, I you know bopped around Europe uh, taking trains. And uh, for me, it was, uh, it was really uh, a great way to, you know, be connected with people. So um, there's another part of transportation that I really love. And that is that um, you're doing something tangible for a community. And um, a lot of the projects that I've worked on have been, you know, really uh, cities like Minneapolis and Phoenix that are, are building their first fixed real transportation system or, or line, single, you know, one line from Mesa to Phoenix. Um, they hadn't had any existing public transportation infrastructure. And I was part of, you know, building something new and unique into that community, into that community, and it becomes part of the fabric of the community. So there's a lot about it, which is really, uh, I, I would say, uh, the tangible feel of actually having made a difference in, in a community. Joe, it was interesting to hear about your Senate testimony, and uh, I think we can consider perhaps that you were ahead of your time, um, and perhaps now they're only just seeing the merits in what you were proposing. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's funny because, you know, at the time we were, we were talking about, you know, um, what is really a big now seemingly a, a big conversation that is going to be had. And, mm -hmm. and Pete Pucci had the new uh, uh, um, uh, head of uh, uh, transportation, the secretary of transportation, has talked about, um, you know, some of the challenges with the highway trust fund and, you know, how we are going to fund uh, public transportation, mm -hmm. what policies are going to be written around. I mean, at the end of the day, what the what what the highway trust fund which funds all of this public transportation and roadway infrastructure bridges etc it's insolvent you know because it relies on gross receipt taxes from you know gas taxes and those have been on the decline and the future for that you know uh for the uh, gross receipt uh, of 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 uh, the taxes on associated with uh, the gas tax are not very promising. I mean, GM and Ford just announced they're going totally electric, right? So mm -hmm. is it sustainable anymore for our nation to rely on, you know, uh, carbon fuel gas to actually fund the, the necessary improvements, repairs and capitalization of our nation's infrastructure? That's a, a very sizable policy debate that's going to be taking place in the next year. You know, and I, I listen to your passion around transportation and so much of that being built on your experience of being on trains and using public transportation. But what about your policy background and training really kind of helped to set you up for success within that sector? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of it is, um, you know, before you can even um, uh, build a um, before you can start even building something, okay, you have to have a problem, right? So there's a, there has to be like a, a corridor where there's, you know, heavy, heavy traffic and a city is trying to deal with congestion, right? So uh, before you can get to the engineering drawing board, mm -hmm. you have to uh, do what uh, is called an alternative analysis, right? So you have a, a corridor that you're examining and you have to look at, can we increase lanes? Can we, you know, increase the, widen the roadways as it were, right? Or we can build some sort of fixed rail transportation or we could build a bus rapid transit system. So, um, you know, I started up front with the sort of the policy side of doing those alternatives analysis and the, uh, that's required now. It's a, it's a policy requirement of the United States Department of transportation that any uh, a municipal area or public transportation uh, 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 planning organization has to do a alternative analysis, a study mm -hmm. to see what makes sense, you know, what makes sense for that particular corridor to solve that transportation challenge. Uh, and then from there, after you've made a decision on that alternative, you have to go through a NEPA process, an environmental review, which is very, very complicated. You know, you have to look at real estate, mm -hmm. you have to look at what the environmental impacts are, and those take years to do. So, you know, I started understanding the upfront stuff, you know, the policy side, the evaluation and the NEPA requirements, the environmental requirements, the policy requirements, and then kind of, I don't want to use the term graduated because in amongst themselves, those are great career paths. But for me, it started, I moved from, uh, I gravitated, I guess is the word. <laughs> 
uh, from the, the planning and the policy and the, you know, dealing with the environmental um, uh, and doing EISs to actually, you know, hard, hard building of, of projects. And initially, my experience on the, on the building side was as a public owner. So mm -hmm. I had, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, working for public transit agencies and actually overseeing the design and construction of major transport systems. And then uh, about uh, 10, 11 years ago, I moved over to the uh, private sector side and I've been mm -hmm. consulting for transit agencies now, uh, mostly uh, uh, New York for the last, uh, for the last 11, 12 years now, so. I actually wanna ask you, ask you about that motivation for that transition from more of that policy mm -hmm. side to the systems delivery and to the development side. Um, and what caused that a little bit more, you know, was, uh, what made you decide to do that? Um, to, to, to move, uh, you know, you know, I think part of it was um, I really wanted to, you know, get my hands into the actual, you know, building of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'm not an engineer by trade. Uh, and I'm, an, I'm a real anomaly in my field, uh, particularly in New York, because uh, New York um, and most states, in fact, most transit authorities require that the consultants who run their programs are PEs, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Professional engineers. I'm not a PE. I'm, 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 I'm not that. Uh, my background is really in, you know, policy and operations and maintenance of transit systems. So um, I kind of, I, you know, I, 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 I grew, I grew to really want to, and the first experience I had was actually in Pittsburgh, uh, as it were. I, um, uh, Paul Scatellis, who is a Penn State alum, and I've mentioned to you before, he's the head of uh, APTA, which is the American Public Transportation uh, Association, which is the really the advocacy uh, group for all public transit agencies in the United States. He's based in Washington. He was the CEO of the Port Authority of Allegheny County. And he said, Joe, you know, you really know about operations and maintenance and you know about policy. I need someone to oversee this uh, new transit project in, in Pittsburgh. Do you want to you want to maybe you know take take a uh, take a role here and help us build this system and and uh, it was literally at an APTA conference in uh, 1998 and uh, he convinced me to to jump ship and 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 get out of the sort of the policy side of things and actually get into building and I fell in love with building uh, so I've been I've been at it now for a good 20 years and I've been involved in projects in in Canada the United States and uh, also in Europe. You're such a great example of the crooked path that we often find ourselves in, but the applicability of policy across all should, parts I, of I that think, spectrum. I think we should talk about that. And uh, in, in, in I think there's a there's probably some questions to be had about you know um, what type of skill sets one could uh, develop. But I think that understanding policy and then with some other skill sets, getting into uh, many different areas, uh, programmatic management of, you know, outputs of policy, because that's mm -hmm. what we're talking about here, right? Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, policies are geared towards programs that ultimately become something tangible in one's community, whether it be health, whether it be education, whether it be transportation, whatever, whatever it is. So making the jump from policy and, and developing policy or being part of the development of policy into actually delivering on policy results is a career path for people who start in public policy. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I told you my my I when I initially was looking at um, uh, graduate school, I was torn between the Institute of Public Policy at University of Michigan and uh, the Masters in Public Administration at uh, at mm -hmm. uh, at Penn State, and I told the public I took the public administration route, so I became so been, a lion. <laughs> you have <laughs> you have been teasing some of your upcoming your current projects which yeah. we want to talk about in just a moment, but we do have a question and yeah. I'm excited because we, I wanted to remind everyone that we are taking questions throughout the event. So let's go ahead and address this one. Yeah. Does policymaking cycle and analysis apply to both private and public institutions um, on the same lens? So you're talking about how you have transitioned to working in the private sector. So they're asking about policymaking in both the private and the public on the private and the public side. Well, you know, the, the, to be perfectly honest with you, there there's areas where um, uh, policy, um, you know, impacts 
um, uh, both the, the, you know, they, 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 they're interwoven in many respects in, in the transportation infrastructure uh, side of things. And in, in my space, I mean, I look at, um, I look at places like Dallas, Texas, which just actually uh, opened their first transit line uh, in 1996 in, in Dallas, Texas, right? Who, who's going to get out of their auto, their, their tr pickup truck in Texas, right? Um, well, Dallas built what is now the third largest street running, you know, uh, light rail system in North America in the last 25 years. Uh, and some of the things they've done is spurred development around their stations. So they've done what's, what's commonly referred to in our industry as trans transit oriented development, where you cluster development around hubs. Uh, and uh, and stations which provide services to people. There's housing. There's you know restaurants. There's you know there's uh, uh, places to you know uh, to go out and shop. Uh, and so there's areas where you know the two go you know really quite hand in hand. You know as a company, my company primarily works in the transportation sphere. We primarily work for public sector clients. You know, we're a consultant engineering firm that supports, you know, projects that are being built by uh, public sector clients. There's another question here. Our, um, we have several in the queue. One is from um, Andrew Mickle. Thank you for giving us your time today, Mr. Marie. I was wondering from your experience, what are the personal qualities or soft skills that are most important or beneficial for those of us interested in public policy and or public advocacy outside of, or pol policy advocacy outside of knowing the professional procedures and processes. Essentially, what are, what parts of ourselves would you recommend really working to develop outside of the classroom? It's, it's a really good question. And I think it, uh, it really gets down to uh, a couple of things. Um, um, let me start with, you know, First of all, we, I, I, I talked a little bit earlier about envisioning the tangible results of policy. And what, 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 um, what I really love about transportation infrastructure is that, you know, you, you have a policy that supports, say, um, you know, municipal policies that support, you know, the types of land uses around trans, transit stations that encourage the type of development that you want in your community. I think one mm -hmm. of the pictures that you have, uh, uh, Whitney, is a picture in Waterloo, Canada. Uh, Let's show a, that. If we could Let's bring that, that up. Yeah. Because it's really, uh, it's really a great example. I spent um, uh, about five years working up in, in Waterloo. And this picture tells, shows, shows you something. So mm -hmm. you have the, this is the day the system opened up. And uh, on, on uh, June 21st and uh, June 21st and, and 2019, uh, mm -hmm. they said they were going to open up um, uh, by the summer and they literally opened up the last day of spring. <laughs> uh, and uh, but as you can see, look what's going on in the background there. Uh, those are condominiums that are really being built uh, over a, you know, um, a, a developed area where there's restaurants and shops and, and places for people to, to, um, to, um, you know, to, to go and to en enjoy life. And one of the interesting things about Waterloo is Waterloo is the smallest municipal area in North America to, act, to actually build a fixed rail transit system. It connects the cities of Kitchener and Waterloo, Ontario. And there's only, the whole municipal area is only about 250,000 people. So they built a 12 mile light rail system to connect the two cities. And the reason why they did it is they, they wanted to really preserve the rural uh, urban fabric. There's really no suburbs in that area. So they wanted to preserve, and so they wanted to create density in the cities. And there's two really terrific universities that are on the alignment, one of them being the University of Waterloo, which is kind of like the MIT of, of, uh, of, um, of Canada. And, um, and so, you know, I, I bring this up because you know, uh, you know, envisioning the tangible results of policy, that's a picture that shows you some of that. Um, this really keeps you enthused about what you do, irrespective of any type of specific policy interests or specialties that you might have. Um, so let's talk about the, the types of skill sets that, you know, will help you get there. Um, first of all, I, 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 I'm going to confess something to you and uh, be very uh, open. 
Um, you know, after 10 years with the MBTA, MBTA and, and actually going to Europe uh, again and, and learning more about transit, uh, I, I, by the time I was 34 years old, was heading up a really, really large uh, uh, transportation project for Metro, uh, Metro Transit in Minneapolis. And, and um, it was the first time I was ever sort of the guy, the one responsible. And I had a great mentor there. Um, who happens to be Ted Mondale, who is the son of Walter Mondale, who was a pres presidential candidate back in the 80s. And, um, you know, Ted gave me some really good advice when I was, you know, 34 years old and felt like I knew it all. Uh, I didn't. And, uh, the, and one of the things that I, I really had to learn about was, was how I communicated with people. And, um, you know, I did very well with sort of the high energy, high octane go get it type folks. But I didn't do really well with people who may have been a little bit more, you know, laid back, may have, you know, uh, listened a little bit different. I had to learn to listen better. And uh, so that was some really good advice. So, um, you know, uh, he, he used to tell me that, Joe, you're, you, you, you know, you're really, you know, you're, you're really good at what you do, but sometimes, you know, you, you kind of suck the oxygen out of the room because you have all the answers. Uh, you really want to get the best out of the people around you. They have to be really comfortable uh, around you that you're really willing to listen. So communication is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, uh, I would, you know, while you're studying po studying policy, I would also tell you that it's probably a good idea to take some uh, time to learn about, you know, how to manage, you know, schedules, how to manage budgets, you know, uh, taking classes potentially in management, because invariably, I believe, you know, policy people kind of follow this same trajectory I have. You know, mm -hmm. I look back to you know, Dave Koshgarian, who worked in the congressional office that I worked with. He was a legislative aide. And now he's a you know, he's he's running a, a fairly large nonprofit in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, so, you know, people do move ultimately move into areas where they're managing time, they're managing people, they're mar managing schedules and they're managing budgets. So to the extent that you can, you know, really try to learn those skill sets and you know, do a deep dive and a deep uh, uh, look at your own way of communicating. And, you know, uh, I, I, I think it's always a good idea to sort of get feedback from people around you in a very, you know, uh, very um, uh, proactive way and make them feel comfortable with being able to tell you that you may be not on the mark. Uh, we have some great questions that would follow up very nicely with the last few that we've had and some of the things that you've said. Um, especially with regards to advocacy and communication. Uh, this one comes from Lizzie Hale. Living in Atlanta last November, citizens voted against expanding the MARTA system to suburban metro cities. I personally voted for the expansion. Have you had to counter policy development aversion and challenges that sometimes go against good judgment and data? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have I ever. Okay. So, you know, this is a great question, and 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 uh, let me start by saying I love Atlanta. Uh, my uh, my very dear friend Jeff Parker uh, is the uh, general manager of the uh, MARTA system. Uh, Jeff and I started the same precise day at the MBTA back in 1986. Uh, it was July 7th, 1986, to be precise. So Jeff and I started in the business together. We've worked together over the years. Our careers have merged and now he's uh, running martyr he was a little bit disappointed that that measure didn't pass but yeah this is um this is kind of the um the pattern in many cities that are you know growing uh atlanta's start, starting the suburbs around atlanta are really exploding uh congestion in atlanta is becoming a major problem you know i think folks and and you know, forgive me for, for saying this, but I think folks in the greater Atlanta region have viewed MARTA as being a way for people living in the urban, most densest parts of uh, Atlanta to get around. And, um, and, you know, so MARTA is a subway system with, that's supported by a bus system. 
Uh, but I think there's room to, uh, to actually grow that system. Have I experienced it? Yeah, I've experienced it um, uh, several times. Um, in, in Orlando, I was working on a project that um, it was a light rail project that was uh, in the final phases of, in, of environmental. Uh, they were getting let getting ready to let actual contracts to start building the system. And uh, one uh, city council member flipped on the project. It was a three, two in favor uh, to go forward with the environmental process. And then when the time came to actually build the project uh, and actually award contracts to build it, uh, they decided not to. Um, In the case of Minneapolis that I I just uh, spoke to, that project actually took 32 years uh, from inception to actually put a shovel in the ground. Mm. Uh, so making, get, you know, getting to yes and getting to go takes a long time. Uh, and right during the middle of the project, that project was actually the champion of that project was Jesse Ventura, which uh, really shocks people because he became governor of, uh, of, of Min- uh, Minnesota. Uh, he was an independent uh, he was a former wrestler. <laughs> I, I was going to say, you might have to remind the students who, yes. who what he was they, before. They may be well before these students signed. Uh, times, WWE but, wrestler. That that's right. Uh, <laughs> Jesse, Jesse the Body Ventura was actually a professional wrestler who became governor. And he managed to wrestle the uh, legislature of uh, Minnesota to believe that they should invi- invest in the uh, the uh, uh, rail line from the airport to uh, downtown. Well, right in the middle of that project, as it was being built, uh, a Republican came into into office and did had very different opinions of the project. And it was Tim Pawlenty, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Governor mm-hmm. Pawlenty was not a supporter of the project. And uh, the legislation was then by then Republican controlled. Uh, they were dead set against the project, but the the project had a you know Metro Transit had a. Uh, contract with the FTA. They took money from the Federal Transit Administration, $700 million to build it. And uh, they were already, as it were, they were they were in the process of building. They couldn't cancel contracts. So we built it despite the fact the governor wasn't very supportive. What's interesting is after it was built, uh, the ridership was far exceeded expectations. Uh, So what was initially expected to be a system that would carry about 17,000 people a day uh, actually was carrying about 28 to 30,000. And now they've built three additional lines. They built a line out to St. Paul. They're building a line out um, out to Chaska and Eden Prairie in the Southwest. So even the Republican legislature now is supporting the buildup of transportation. So really sometimes it's a matter of getting that first line in the ground and seeing how it works. And the recent case history on new starts, and we've talked a little bit up, uh, about this in the run-up to our call today, um, cities like Salt Lake City, which aren't exactly a bastions of liberalism, uh, have actually you know, started light rail systems and they've just exploded. Uh, and so the, the, the trans, you know, public transportation hasn't really become, it's the, the debate of highway versus transit has mm-hmm. really evolved. Um, so I, I'm actually, uh, you know, what's happened in the last 25 years with all of the new systems that have sprung up in places that you wouldn't you know, generally think would, would happen, like Dallas or Salt Lake City, uh, have happened. And they've been uh, wildly successful. This is kind of following up on that. We have a question here from uh, Jacqueline Kamau, I hope I pronounced that right, from Kenya. I have an interest in public policy and I've been wondering how to manage political interests when developing policy. What's the best practice so far? Which model has worked for you? Um, uh, Dealing with with political interests or, I'm I'm sorry, could you? I would say probably she's asking about managing different political interests. Yeah, it really become it really comes down to a management of of of, of expectations. Um, you know, look, that I, I'm not going to uh, suggest to you that that building uh, transportation infrastructure is easy when you do finally get the shovels on the ground. It is really uh, difficult to get to go. Number one, to build the consensus around it is difficult, and that takes time. What's really really challenging is during the build. Uh, East Side Access, the project I'm working on now, is probably the easiest project I've ever worked on from a community standpoint, uh, because it's underground. We are below the earth. We're not, you, you wouldn't even know this project was being built if you lived in Manhattan. 
There's no signs of it. But if you look at a project like Waterloo, which we showed the picture of, that's a street running real system. You are impacting businesses, you're impacting people's lives, you're building in front of their homes, in front of their, you know, neighborhoods and through their neighborhoods. So, you know, you really need to let people know up front and be really honest with them that there is going to be some pain before there's gain. Uh, there will be business impacts and you need to manage those impacts um, uh, and, and let people know in advance that, you know, there, there's, this is not easy, uh, that it's a, it's a process. And these, these systems typically take, you know, the Waterloo system from shovel in the ground to build took three years. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, granted, they weren't building in the same place for three years, but while they were building right through the heart of central Waterloo, there was impacts, you know, and the restaurant owners and the people weren't happy. You, you, you really need to communicate with them and get out there in the community and speak to folks and talk to them about this is what we're going to do to preserve access to your business. And this is what we're, how we're going to help you communicate that to your, your, to your customers. And these are all the various stakeholders that you have to have buy-in as you're going into these projects. Ab absolutely, because okay. you know, the reality is, is, is folks in the political world, particularly, uh, you know, uh, council members and people at that level, people who really deal with constituents on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, they're they're really worried about, you know, mom and pop shops on Main Street that are mm -hmm. that are impacted. Okay, mm -hmm. now governors have a very different uh, perspective uh, and I deal with a very involved governor on a and I want to ask you yeah I want to ask you about here that. in New York so uh, that that dynamic is altogether very different it's it's uh, it's really about you know perception and but we'll get into that so I'll, I'll, that, I'll that's what I wanted to, to, to talk about a little bit next unless Catherine had something else she wanted okay so you've got a lot happening right now yeah <laughs> It, it, especially in New York. Um, and one is the Moynihan station that yep. just opened up on New Year's. So right. I want you to tell us about several of these projects that you have happening in New York right now. And talk to us a little bit about the stakeholders involved and some of the policy challenges that you've had to deal with and how you navigate all of these stakeholders. Let's let's show some photos as we're talking about this as well, too. Sure. But yeah, so, if you could go over some of some of the projects that you're currently working on. So this is the Monaghan train hall, and for folks um, who live in the United States, this looks like it was probably a picture taken of a station in uh, France or Spain or Germany where. Um, you know, the, the, this was the old uh, Moynihan Post Office building, which was converted into a train hall. Uh, and the, the architectural intent here was to really, um, you know, it really bring out the beautiful buildings that are in the backgrounds and uh, around the station. So uh, these glass canopies were, were erected uh, with the steel beam so that you, you knew where you were in New York because if oh. you go through, if you go through uh, Penn Station now and you come into Penn Station, you, it seems like you're coming into a dungeon. Uh, and it's really cavernous and it's not, you know, there's really no real clean lines or spaces. Um, so uh, it's a very, uh, this is a really, this is a 21st century greeting to New York, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you come in on a train uh, and your first perception of New York was Penn Station, you were like, what? <laughs> this is not great. Uh, but now when you come into Penn Station on an inner city train, this is what you see when you come up from the, from the train deck. Um, if you go to the next one, I, this is uh, this is my current work in progress. So this is the um, this is the train hall um, and for east side access. Uh, this is actually you can see here on the left. This is one of the longest and steepest elevators in the entire uh, uh, western hemisphere. Uh, the station is actually 80 to 100 feet below ground, underneath the existing um, the existing um, um, Grand Central Station. So this allows Long Island Railroad trains to be diverted from Penn Station and actually uh, uh, into Midtown Manhattan through Grand Central Terminal. Uh, this is a enormously challenging project uh, because of the civil uh, works involved. Mm. Um, 
but let's place it in its in the context of of stakeholders and um, and um, and the dynamic of of uh, and the shifting of policy uh, in New York. Um, uh, Governor Cuomo is intimately involved uh, in these projects. Um, I had the pleasure of working on the uh, Second Avenue subway, which opened uh, on New Year's Eve. There's a pattern, as you can see, right? Moynihan <laughs> opened on New Year's Eve, and Second Avenue subway opened on New Year's Eve because Governor Governor Cuomo said they will open by the end of the year or else. <laughs> <laughs> the or the or else part of it is actually what keeps me up at night uh, because <laughs> I now have a uh, will open by December 31st of 2022 on East Side Access or else hanging over my head. Uh, <laughs> and tell uh, tell us these these are long ongoing projects. Yeah, yeah. the uh, The East Side Access project broke ground in 1999. So. It's an enormously complicated undertaking. I mean, it's um, it's it's really taking trains that used to go into Penn Station and routing them through a whole new area of Queens and then down under the East River in a tunnel, and then taping take a sharp left turn as it comes into uh, Manhattan uh, down along Park Avenue and Madison Avenue and underneath the existing uh, Grand Central Terminal. So there was a lot of work that had to go be done in Queens and in the river. Uh, mm -hmm. Before we could even get, you know, into tunnel boring into uh, into uh, Manhattan and actually dig out and excavate the caverns and actually build it. So this project is 20 years in the making. I have mm -hmm. my three lead engineers have been with the project since its inception in 1999. So, wow. Joe, and in a world of instant gratification, how will you keep yourself and your team motivated for that long? You know, it, that, that's a challenge, <laughs> you know, but, you know, you know, these, the folks that typically do this work, um, you know, I, I have to say that I've been engaged on projects that lasted six or seven years, um, uh, never one that has lasted long at this, but there were a lot of victories along the way, you know, like mm -hmm. what was done in Queens were um, in, in, in itself, you know, the Harold interlocking and managing all the trains. This is, we're talking about the busiest rail corridor in North America. Amtrak is competing for space. Long Island Railroad is competing for space. The Port Authority is competing for space. New Jersey Transit is comp competing for space on, you know, essentially in the same sort of track lineage. So taking that traffic and diverting it through another part of Queens and actually, you know, getting into uh, a tube underneath the East River, a new tunnel uh, underneath the East River, you know, finishing those projects were in themselves mega projects, right? They were a mm -hmm. couple of billion dollars a piece, right? So um, we're now in the Manhattan end yeah. of the project. So, you know, there were victories along the way. There were, you know, hey, we're done with this. We're done with Northern Avenue. We're done with this piece. We're done with this piece. But now the, the final piece is actually getting into Manhattan and actually depositing, uh, you know, trains into Manhattan and testing trains and doing safely. And we are now in the phase of, of actually testing. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we'll be moving our first trains uh, into uh, Manhattan uh, in June. So you mentioned working with Governor Cuomo, and yep. um, I know you've said New York is a tough place to work. You've worked in many different places. Um, how do you adapt your communication style, your leadership style, and how has your public policy and public administration training helped you throughout that, that, those adaptations? Yeah, so you, you ask a great question. Is this being recorded? Yes, it is. It is okay. All right. <laughs> so let me start by saying that Governor Cuomo and the MTA are great people to work for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to start with that. They really are. I mean, uh, MTA is is a great organization, and you know they have the nation's largest mass transit system, and on a day to day basis, carry millions and millions of people. Public transit is under stress right now because of COVID and ridership is down and it's very, very difficult, but those frontline employees have done a remarkable job. Um, so let's talk about, you know, um, Governor Cuomo has a very particular style, a uh, very particular expectation about uh, communication. He's very direct. And just to be perfectly candid with you, I think this works for most people uh, and it's a good thing for most folks in terms of communication. Uh, 
you need to have your answers. You need to be direct and you need to be to, to the point. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and if you don't know the answer, uh, you need to just say, I don't have an answer for that. I will need to get back to you because um, let's just say BS doesn't work with him. He is, uh, he will sniff it out and he'll start probing and you'll find yourself in trouble. Mm. Uh, he's, uh, he's a very, you know, he expects the, the, the best from himself and he expects the best from people around him. So, um, you know, learning to um, adapt to that, that was a little bit, a bit of a learning process to adapt to that sort of, uh, you know, that approach, you know, that very direct, you know, he's, he's literally going to go in the tunnel and look at stuff and say, why aren't there more people working here? He's very hands-on. Um, so, uh, so, th you know, that there, there's a level of sort of communication that happens there where, you know, he's an executive, he wants a succinct, direct, straightforward, no nonsense, give me the truth answer. Um, you know, some of the conversations that you have with, uh, with, uh, with municipal, uh, you know, and sort of like city level folks, um, not at the state level where they're looking big picture budget dollars impacts, right? What's this gonna, what's this gonna mean for us, right? If we're late, or if there's a major budget, bu bu uh, uh, budget blow up, you know, at the municipal level, uh, you know, the, the concerns are the same. Uh, and, um, you know, you know, the, but the but the tenor of the conversations, I will tell you that you know, working in I you, we showed the picture of many uh, of of Waterloo, um, you know, working in Canada was really quite interesting for me uh, in the style of of government governance and the style of people who worked in governance was very very different, um, you know, uh, they were really uh, very very easy to work with and. Um, you know, I, there are times when you're as a consultant working for, uh, you know, MTA or a large public bureaucracy that has an institutional culture to itself, um, you kind of have to adapt to them, right? Mm -hmm. um, for, for, for smaller organizations that are doing the first, this, this was Waterloo's first fixed rail transit system. So they really were just starting into it. So, you know, uh, there wasn't really any institutional culture around the project. It was just, let's get the job done. So we felt really, our team of, of, of consultants felt very, we felt very much like we were part of that organization, mm -hmm. uh, that we were like, you know, part of the governance and part of the ownership of the project. Um, you know, we always feel pretty close as consultants, but, you know, the agencies are really the ones that have the ownership. They're the ones that are stewards of taxpayer money. And they're the ones that really feel, you know, you know, in control. And in and, and Waterloo, it was really much more of a collaboration. It was a, a wonderful dynamic. And I don't know if maybe that was just, uh, you know, you know, I've done business in Canada before, but I've found that, you know, that was just sort of the nature of governance in Canada. You know, it was very municipally focused and very locally focused, focused and very hands-on. I spent a lot of time out in the community talking to people who were, you know, business owners and I was a consultant. I wasn't the guy managing the project. You know, there was a public owner that was managing the project. We were just their engineer but they brought us into the picture and we really felt a sense of ownership. So it was, it was lovely. We have a question from one of our MPP students, uh, Kai Outhouse, um, and he is interested if you have any insight on the queue line that opened in Detroit in 2017. His knowledge on the line is that it has been exceedingly underwhelming. It has very low ridership, long delays and waits, and a very poor public perception. What can be done to improve a rail line like this and increase ridership and reliability? As a Michigan, Miss, Michigander, I thought it would be a great asset for Detroit, but it clearly seems to need improvements. Thanks, Kai. Kai, you know, I, you know, it, it, it is really, the queue line is a real outlier when it comes to recent uh, public transportation infrastructure projects. Um, and it's, it was a bit, a bit of a surprise to me as well. Um, if you look at, you know, the track record over the last 25 years, new systems that were built in Sacramento, San Diego, Salt Lake City, Dallas, St. Louis, Minneapolis, um, you know, Seattle, Portland, 
the, the, the start was terrific. And then it was like, what do we build next? I can tell you right now that Waterloo has decided to build the next line already. They opened their first line in 2019 and now they're expanding their system to Cambridge. So that's been the, the reality over the last 25 years. I could show you a map of all the 25 new rail systems that have been built in the, in the United States and Canada in the last 25 years. There's been on average one a year. And every single one of them with the exception of two have been expanded upon three or four fold. So Dallas started with, you know, you know, 25 trains and seven miles, and now it's uh, 350 trains and 96 miles of transit in 25 years. Uh, Denver started with 14 trains and 6.7 miles, and they're up to more than 200 trains, and they're carrying people, they're carrying two, 300,000 people a day. So uh, I think that Detroit has had two bad experiences, uh, quite frankly, uh, in recent times. Uh, and, um, you know, I, you know, the, the, what happened in the queue line is reliability uh, very early, and Kai, you can confirm if, if I'm corrected on that. Crime, I'm correct on this. Um, is was was not good. That it was reliable, unreliable out of the box, and that creates a a sort of bad, um, uh, uh, you know. It creates a bad impression. That first impression, if you're not reliable on day one and you're not on time and you don't give the service that you promise the citizens. Uh, that can have a sort of spiraling, spiraling uh, effect. Uh, and, you know, what, what's really going to be required over time is that for people's competence in the system would improve. And the only way that can happen is if they improve the reliability and operations of the system. Um, and, you know, how they get there and how they market that is going to be a big challenge. Otherwise, the system is going to remain underutilized. Um, so, it's unfortunate, but it is definitely an anomaly, uh, and it's an outlier in terms of uh, the overall success of individual transit projects that have been built. I'm talking about fixed rail type of infrastructure, and including bus rapid transit systems that have been built over the last 25 years that have been incredibly successful. So we have just a couple moments left before we wrap up, and we're so excited that uh, we have been getting a lot of questions here from everybody who's joined us. Uh, one question that we didn't get to yet is, have you enjoyed your time more in the private or public sector? That is a great question. Um, I enjoyed them. Um, I enjoyed the public side immensely. Um, you know, I, you have a sense of, again of ownership when you're on the public side and you're a steward of uh, of uh, taxpayer money. And your, your focus is really on, you know, you know again, I, I, I was in operations and maintenance, then I went to the sort of capital construction side. So my focus has been on building new things. Um, so you have a, you have a sense of uh, satisfaction when you finish something and you get something done. Uh, and a sense of ownership uh, that I miss and to some degree as a consultant. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I miss that sense of ownership and being a public steward uh, in some ways. Um, but I had uh, three kids to put to college. And, <laughs> and let's just say that um, uh, the private sector uh, certainly has its uh, benefits in terms of salary ranges. <laughs> uh, I hate to sound so, uh, you know, mercurial about that. But, uh, but the, uh, the reality is, is that you know, I, I, I moved on to uh, the private side uh, because I, I, I really wanted to, um, uh, to take on big challenges and, um, you know, it's, it's worked out, it's worked out very well. So I, it's, for me, it's not really an either or, like, what do I prefer more? I, I enjoyed both. Um, I haven't entirely ruled out the possibility of ultimately returning to the public side uh, for, for one last spell, but um, we'll see what, we'll see what happens. So, Joe, there's a lot of conversation about climate conservation and uh, reduction of carbon emissions. How much conversation is there about mass transit infrastructure spending? And are you hopeful that under the current administration, since we have a president who's a supporter of Amtrak and major infrastructure projects that we might see some more spending? 
Well, I, I, I think there's a reason why they call him Amtrak Joe, right? Um, <laughs> he, he takes the train. Um, so I, I think this administration is going to be uh, very, very strongly pushing um, um, uh, uh, mass transit uh, uh, I think I think if you look at what happened in 2009 when they passed the American uh, Reinvestment and Recovery Act, uh, a large part of that you know that bill was geared towards uh, supporting mass transit. And and um, I think the big challenge moving forward because we, we we you touched upon carbon emissions and and um, and we touched earlier upon the Highway Trust Fund is how we gonna, how we're going to pay for it. Right. Mm. They're they're dipping into the general fund. And if you read the Congressional mm. Budget Office's recent analyses of the Highway Trust Fund, and I did that actually before I got on this call because I didn't I wanted to be up on policy uh, and because uh, I'm focused on my project too much. Um, but, you know, the, the, the system is just it's having to be infused with general funds because there's just simply not enough gas gas taxes come in. So so I think the big challenge and the big debate, the big policy debate is going to be do we go to a uh, VMT type of system, okay, uh, where vehicle miles traveled becomes the, uh, the becomes the source of, of, of how we evaluate and how we, you know, generate revenue for, uh, for transit. That was floated under the Obama, Obama administration in 2009 by Secretary Ray LaHood, uh, who was a Chicago guy who grew up taking transit. Uh, and he actually uh, floated the idea, but it was very quickly dismissed. Um, but there is, a, there is, there, there is, I think, a g emerging consensus that uh, that the that, that the um, the gas tax in itself is not the solution. It's just simply not mm -hmm. enough to pay for everything that gets needs to get done. So I think that's a, that's a big issue. The other big issue, we talked for GM going full electric, right? Mm -hmm. What's that mean to you know? Look, the the world is moving towards alternatives to carbon fuels. So that's a big policy discussion that has to take place. I think that takes place without even a conversation of, you know, reducing carbon emissions. They're going to be reduced naturally because people are moving uh, to electric. Um, in terms of um, of transit and the investment that the federal government will likely make in transit, I expect it to be fairly significant. I've, I expect a fairly significant infrastructure bill to pass fairly early in this Congress. I believe it will pass this year before June. Uh, and I think it's going to be significant. It'll be the first major omnibus bill that will pass uh, mm -hmm. in the last 14 years. Uh, FAST Act that was passed in 2014 was really kind of a stopgap for six years, okay? It really wasn't enough. Um, the bigger question, and I think this is the one that really challenges me, is how much of, you know, if you look at Pennsylvania, let's bring this right back to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's existing road and bridge network is falling apart. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania has uh, a tremendous problem with their existing bridge infrastructure, with structural obsolescence and, stru uh, and, 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 and structural, you know, uh, challenges. I mean, they there's just it's an aging mid-Atlantic state that has big infrastructure challenges, like many of the states in the in the Northeast and the Midwest. So. You know, the question for states like Philadelphia or for states like Pennsylvania is, you know, do we spend on new? Do we build new or do we really invest that in state of good repair? And that's the big debate that's going to happen for in states like Pennsylvania. You know, mm -hmm. do we do we build do we do we expand SEPTA? Uh, do we make mm -hmm. SEPTA bigger? Do we, you know, grow SEPTA, or does SEPTA really start taking a hard look at their backlog of state of good repair on their existing system, and actually bring it into the 21st century? Right. Um, that is, I, I believe, the most compelling, you know, sort of, you know, policy question: How the federal government is going to reward that investment? You know. Do they want to continue building new or do we really start focusing on what the United States in the 1970s was number one in the world in infrastructure? We had the best infrastructure, okay? We're now falling behind countries like Slovenia. We've dropped into the 20s and our per capita investment in transportation infrastructure and infrastructure is 2.5% of GDP. 
Uh, you know, countries uh, in Europe are spending upwards to six, seven percent of GDP on infrastructure. That's why you got terrific high-speed real networks all over Europe that are connected and interoperable now. Right, they're all part of one system. You can operate a German ICE train uh, into Paris. Mm -hmm. You can operate a TGV uh, into Spain. So mm -hmm. you know Europe has really uh, taken uh, a, 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 a very much more aggressive uh, investment uh, program in their infrastructure. The first time I took the train from Frankfurt to Cologne, it took me two hours and fifty-two minutes. Back in 1986. Okay, the mm -hmm. summer after my, my mm -hmm. first year at Penn State. Okay, I went two summers ago from Frankfurt to Cologne on the ICE in 52 minutes. They cut the travel time by mm -hmm. 70%. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's attractive. No one takes an airplane now from Frankfurt to Cologne. They don't even fly that route anymore. You get, off the, you get off the plane in Frankfurt. I flew from Boston to Frankfurt. I jumped on the train to Cologne. I was in downtown Cologne in 52 minutes, right underneath the cathedral, mm -hmm. right there. You could see it, actually. You could see the cathedral because they had these beautiful glass panels that you could actually see the cathedral through. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that that's, you know, you know, the U.S. really needs to think about how far we're falling behind on in infrastructure spending. Mm -hmm. And it's not just transit infrastructure. It's our water supply system. OK, uh, mm -hmm. we're really dealing with, you know, uh, challenges on, on water in many mm -hmm. areas and the the security of that water, cybersecurity and in, in protecting that investment is going to be also, I think, a piece that needs to be uh, addressed in any, you know, uh, omnibus uh, infrastructure bill. We've had so many great questions, and we did have another one from one of our first year students, Sam Nur, who was asking about dealing with new developments like ride sharing services and COVID, um, but we're not able to get to it. We would love to have you back, Joe, for another one of these because we didn't even touch half of our questions. You've been great. I'm and too long winded. Wanna... <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was great talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us, Joe Marie, and thank you, everyone everyone for all of your questions. We hope that you'll join us for our next conversation, which will happen on Wednesday, March 10th at 3 p.m., part of the Profile Series. Our guest will be Natalie Krug, Director of the Bureau of Budget Analysis in the Pennsylvania Governor's Budget Office. You can learn more about our events and watch recordings of this talk and other videos from the School of Public Policy on our website, publicpolicy.psu.edu. I'm Whitney Sheridan, along with Katherine Baumgartner, for all of us with the School of Public Policy. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.